Maybe one of the reasons so many people in the church aren't making disciples of all nations is because they're not really disciples in the first place. You think about Jesus and his disciples from the very beginning to the very end. Making disciples is in the DNA of this thing, right? To be a disciple involves making disciples. Follow me, Matthew 4, and I will, what? I'll make you fishers of men. Never make a gospel appeal to people's emotions. Never. Never. That's why we don't have some kind of an emotional appeal here and play all kinds of small team music in the background. And it amazes me that we believe this, that God would crush and kill His own Son, but let you slide. Not for a minute. At this moment, God commands all men to repent and believe that today is the day of salvation, that you are to flee from the wrath to come, to flee from the law of Moses that condemns you into the city of refuge who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Run to Him. And welcome to G220 Radio. I'm Ricky Gantz, joined with George Alvarado, and we are G220 Radio, and we've got a pretty good show for you lined up here today. And I was just thinking about this. I was saying this to my wife earlier, George. Uh, This is 2017, and the episode number is 217. I don't know. I don't know, man. Whoa. You think it's Providence, or are we suspicious here? What's going on? I I, I don't know. It's just the 217. I was like, man, that's kind of... Works out kind of nice, but uh, no. How you doing, brother? Praise the Lord. Good, good, man. It's been busy days for me. I'm actually I'm still still at work, so I'm praying that uh, nobody interrupts me. I have all the lights off, the door is locked, so hopefully nobody requires anything from me. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, I remember those days in the military. Um, I don't know if you guys do you guys do like 24 hour duty? Do you guys do those things in the Air Force? Uh, yeah, of course. Why? Yeah, why well, I just did because I mean it's the Air Force. I mean, it's like uh, you know, not everybody it, can be not everybody can be a watchdog all night. All right, some people got right. other things they got to do. But yeah, I, I get what you're trying to get at. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you know, I mean, like because in the military, you know, uh, well, the real military in the, in the army, oh, you know, the here Marines, we go. but uh, no, seriously. Um, no, I was just wondering uh, if you guys do that. I remember it used to have those uh, 24-hour duties, man, and and that was so rough. I remember in in uh, uh, Korea. I was stationed in Korea and you're sitting at the desk and you know, you're trying to fight the sleep and you're the NCO and you've got a soldier with you, you know, a, a soldier on duty with you and you're trying to fight it. And you're just like, your eyes are going and you're fighting it. And, and then you, you kind of, you know how like you, you take that quick second sleep uh-huh. and then you open your eyes. It feels like it was just a second that you close your eyes and first sergeant standing right there looking at you. Yeah. Like, that's uh, it. yeah. Not a good, not a good feeling. <laughs> no, it's not a good feeling, but, uh, especially when uh, you get charged with dereliction of duty. Yeah, yeah, that would be bad. That would be bad. Um, so, uh, yep, I don't miss those days when it comes to duty, uh, but I do miss those days when it comes to travel because uh, that was one of the great things of being in the military, of going to some different places, being in some new duty stations. Uh, that can be challenging for some, I mean, but uh, – Every once in a while, I get to move to a new place and a new new area, and and just to get to live somewhere different. Uh, yeah. That was an exciting time. <clears throat> so, uh, as we said, man, 2017, uh, it is a new year. So happy new year to you, the listeners. Um, I got new something year. I want to play yeah. here. It's a it's a it's about a three minute clip. Uh, it's something called the Bible Project. I don't know if anybody's heard of this before, um, but I'm going to play this three-minute clip. And what I would like from you guys, if you've heard of this Bible Project before, um, send us an email, g220radio at gmail.com. I'd like to know more about it. I know a friend of mine uh, referred me to it before, and I really didn't get the opportunity to check it out. But um, from what I did see of it, I was like, yeah, this is pretty cool. Um, but um, we're going to play this clip, and then we're going to come back and – you know, like I said, if you if you know about this Bible project on YouTube, 
uh, please send us an email. Tell me about it. If it's solid, if it's not solid, I mean, I would like to know that. Um, check this out. And then we're going to come back and, and talk a little bit about some resolutions or uh, if there's any uh, Bible reading plans or anything that you have, George, or, you know, how you try to set out your year for uh, reading the scriptures. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we come back from this short clip. We know that the Bible is long and for many people an intimidating book. But we believe that the entire thing is telling one unified story that leads us to Jesus. And so we want to help you learn how to read the Bible as you actually read through the entire thing for yourself. So the Read Scripture experience is, first of all, a reading plan that has broken up the story of the Bible into 16 chapters. Now, we've rearranged the order of some of the books to help you see how this overall story works and how each book contributes to it. So we begin with creation of the world and the fall of humanity, which leads to God's covenant promises to Abraham and his family, the people of Israel. Then you come to God's rest rescue of Israel in the exodus from Egypt, which is followed by the covenant God makes with them at Mount Sinai. From there, God leads Israel through the wilderness and then into the promised land, where Israel grows into a nation and breaks the covenant. And so this flows into the rise and the fall of Israel's kingdom, which ends with Israel being exiled from the land. Now, the story pauses right here, and you'll read through the poetry of the prophets who lived before Israel's exile, and also of the wisdom writings that reflect on this part of the story as well. After this, the story will pick up again, and you'll read the writings of the prophets who lived during the exile, then about the return of Israel from exile, and the writings of the prophets who lived after the exile. You'll conclude the Old Testament with the book of Chronicles. It's a summary of the story so far and how it all points forward to Jesus. And finally, we come to Jesus himself and his announcement of the kingdom of God, which is then followed by the letters of the apostles to the people of Jesus' kingdom. Finally, we'll conclude the entire biblical story with the Revelation, a poetic vision of Jesus' return and the healing of all creation. Now, each of these 16 chapters has a number of reading sessions it will take to complete it. Some of these are shorter, others are longer. And if you take just 15 to 20 minutes a day to complete each session, you'll be able to read through the entire Bible in less than a year. Now, even with this map, many books of the Bible are really confusing. It's very easy to get lost. And so when you start each new book of the Bible, you'll be able to watch a short video that lays out that book's structure and flow of thought, and it'll give you tips about what kinds of things to look for as you read. But also, every book contributes to the overall story of the Bible as well. And so we'll have theme videos placed at strategic points in the reading plan to help you see how the part of the Bible you're reading at the moment fits into that larger story. Finally, each day's reading session includes a psalm, because we believe that reading the Bible is not just an intellectual experience, but also spiritual. And so we invite you to take the year to develop the daily habit of praying through the psalms. And by the end of the year, you'll have prayed through the whole book of psalms two and a half times. Our hope is that the Read Scripture experience will help you read through the entire Bible with greater understanding than you ever have before. So you can see for yourself the beauty and the wisdom of this ancient story that points us to Jesus. All right, and welcome back. I uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, little clip there, the Bible Project. George, you ever heard of the Bible Project? Mm, sounds vaguely familiar, but no, nothing's coming to my head right now. Yeah, a friend of mine um, had mentioned it to us. We got a little um, text group that uh, a few of the, the brothers over here in, in our area, um, you know, kind of communicate with each other every day. And, uh, yeah, he, he had put it out there, and, and I saw a few videos of it. I, I watched, I think, one or two of them where it just kind of goes through the story of a, a certain book, kind of gives you the, you know, what the book's about. And mm -hmm. uh, I was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. It, it's like, it's on YouTube and it's kind of like a, a drawing type thing where you're watching it as it's animating it through there. Um, and uh, I thought, well, this is pretty interesting, but it's with a Bible reading, you know, plan type of thing. And uh, I don't know anything else about it. I really didn't take the time to look at it, but I was thinking about this as we was getting ready to do the show tonight um, and thinking about, you know, it's 2017 people usually have, Many people set New Year's resolutions. Many people, um, they, they, sometimes those, those don't work out, New Year's resolutions. But, and the same thing with, with Bible reading plans. You know, people set up something and say, you know, I'm going to try to get through the Bible this year. And uh, they'll 
still try different plans. And so it was just something I, I saw uh, before coming on the show. So I figured, oh, I'll, I'll throw that in there and put it out there. So like I said, for the listeners, if you've never heard of it or, you, I mean, if you have heard of it uh, and want to let us know about that, if you know it's solid or not solid, please let us know. Um, but what, what about Bible reading plans for you, man, or, or New Year's resolutions when it comes to that? Do you have anything you usually set or any type of reading plan you like to do or do you come up with your own? Yeah, I don't do New Year's resolutions, and um, I know some people may scoff at this or even sneer or even probably say, what? But I don't do Bible reading plans either. Um, I don't sit there, and I don't try to follow anybody's Bible reading plan. I open the Word of God. Uh, I do have a book that I normally like to go through, or sometimes as I'm sitting there and I'm meditating on something in Scripture or I'm thinking about something that needs to be taught or I'm dealing with a particular topic or subject, uh, at times I'll sit there and be like, well, I need to read through the whole book or I need to read through certain books of the New Testament within a particular week or a particular month for whatever reason. Um, and I find that the Bible reading plans for myself are the ones where I actually sit down, I enjoy it, I'm trying to figure something out, I'm seeking God for something, I'm looking for answers on a particular subject or topic. And that never gets boring because I'm always thinking about other things <laughs> and there's always things that are uh, somewhat of a challenge, especially if you're out witnessing often. There's always going to be something you're going to be challenged by. Um, so for myself, there's not a particular plan I read through. I know there's people that do do that, and you know sometimes it works for them. But I don't want. To, I just don't want to make God's word a drudgery. Uh, and I think a, a reading plan for myself would do that. So I, I just tend to avoid mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I, I personally um, have never done a Bible reading plan myself, um, but I do know that uh, sometimes with people that, that have done those, they get discouraged because what will happen is you start on it, you start doing, and you're supposed to read so many chapters or whatever uh, a day, uh, and then you get behind. You know, you miss mm. or you don't spend as much time in there, and then you feel you, – maybe you get two days behind, and then people feel like, well, you know what? I just give up, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, me personally, I've always been – now, I don't – when you said you, you get a book, you're not like just – you don't just say – I'm going to flip it open and wherever my finger lands type thing. Right. I mean, no, 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 not like that. Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> I have it's a plan, but I don't have like a Bible right. reading plan. Like everybody else has it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same thing for me. Like it, for me, it's, it's whatever I'm um, interested in a topic of something I may go into a book or, or if there's something that with reading the book, the Bible, um, being that I work as a mailman every day and I've got about eight hours to listen to stuff. uh, A lot of times I love listening through um, the word of God um, because Mm -hmm. it gives me the opportunity to go out there and just listen through it. And there's many books that I love to listen through um, multiple times. Like I love going through the judges. I love listening through that. I love listening through the book of Genesis, you know, just going through that. Uh, And then the new Testament, I love to do the new Testament. I'll do the gospels. But then I love to just put it on, start from the epistles and go through all mm-hmm. the epistles. And, and, and when it's, and, and I put it up on a, a fa- and I'm able to get through, you know, the epistles in a couple of days, you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. Which is great. Uh, but when you're listening to it at fast speed, sometimes you do miss things. That's why it's good to read, uh, you know, when you, you have the time to open up the word of God and actually sit down and read it. But, uh, I'll tell you, man. Yeah, I do the same thing. I definitely, like, I'll pick a book, and, you know, sometimes I I do spend a lot of time studying. Other times, almost like just enjoying the sunrise, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll usually I'll be in this particular portion of the New Testament or Old Testament, and I, I won't I won't purposefully try to exegete too much. I will just try to sit back and just drink it back and enjoy the Word of God as it is. Um, and obviously, there's probably going to be something that's going to attach my attention, and so inevitably, I'll, I'll probably dig into the language or I'll look into some other references. But for the most part, I just try to sometimes just open it and just read straight through, and that's very, very beneficial because you get the whole story sometimes, and you get the bigger picture in a quicker snapshot. Yeah. What What are some of the uh, What are some of the things you like to listen to? Uh, you know, maybe podcast if you have time, apart from G220. The network because i understand <laughs> i understand that that would be top top uh dog right there but uh you know what are some of the things you like to listen to because me personally I, i've come across this um theology simply profound uh, and it's a couple of presbyterian brothers um you know and I, I don't know a lot about them either but i found it because i was you know doing some uh listening on to some some of the book of revelation and dispensationalism and and their take on that 
and and I've just been loving it, man. I, I've I've really been yeah. loving uh, listening to their program, and it's just a, a new show that I found. I, I, like I said, I don't really know much else about them, um, but I'm always trying to find other things to listen to, and and so I came across them, and that's something I've really been been digging for uh, you know the last couple couple. Uh, maybe it's been a week or so. I think I've I've come across them. What about you, man? Yeah. Anything you like to listen to? I'm not a faithful podcast listener, of, like you said, other than G220 Radio. I never really have been. I'll listen to or watch on YouTube different things that, uh, depending on the subject, will attach my t- attract my attention. I think it's mostly uh, certain preachers or teachers that seem to attract my attention the most. Obviously, recently I've been uh, listening to a lot more linguistic podcasts, whether it's from like Bible teachers. Um, or even secular teachers that are teaching about linguistics. So there are different YouTube pages I subscribe to, or even some podcasts like Lexicon Valley, which sometimes can be a little bit crude. I, I don't listen to some of their episodes, but there are other podcasts that are just from a linguistic perspective that I'll listen to. And then, of course, certain teachers like Dan Wallace um, uh, is one of my favorites. Uh, I like listening to him a lot. And uh, there are other teachers out there within the realm of Christianity who are either, you know, specializing in specific books or they specialize in a particular language and they'll go over different aspects of the scriptures and it's that's that's where most of my reading comes from. Of course there are some famous preachers I'll listen to, like Piper MacArthur, Paul Washer, um, or even some lesser preachers that people don't even know about that I'll find on Sermon Audio. Um, but that's it. I don't really have a faithful podcast I've ever really sat down and always been faithful to other than this one. Yeah. Yeah, you better say this one. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> uh, speaking of the G220 Radio and G220 Radio Network, uh, you know, some shows that we got coming up this month. I mean, tonight, if you're listening and you're wondering where Austin is, um, you know, he was unable to be with us tonight. He's not feeling well. So if you can remember him in your prayers, just pray for him. Uh, we do have prayer meeting tomorrow. And, and uh, you know, I know uh, – being sick is a hard thing for him because he loves to spend his time in the Word and study for uh, the upcoming sermon. So pray for him. He's not going to be with us tonight. We're still going to go on with the show talking about uh, how to reach uh, millennials uh, from an article that we've got uh, called 12 Reasons Millennials Are Over uh, the Church. But uh, some shows that we got coming up, man, we've, we've got some uh, – some good things coming up this month. I mean, January 10th, we're going to be talking about understanding submission in the local church, and that's going to be with Pastor Mike Reed. Uh, We're going to talk about cessationism or continuationism on the 17th of this month with Stephen Eli and Peter Boland. And then on the 24th, uh, which is a very, uh, this is a really tough topic, uh, but we're going to try to, we're going to uh, address it and uh, we're going to do it with caution and, and, uh, you know, really, um, take this one to heart here is addressing domestic violence in the church. Uh, and that's with pastor Tom Shuck, who's your pastor. I don't know if you want to yes, say sir. anything about, about him. Uh, yeah. At the moment. I'll say something real quick. Love him. Absolutely. Wonderful brother. Um, he loves linguistics like I do. So that's a plus. And he is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the experience that he has, especially when he was a missionary to India. So I'm really looking forward to that episode because we had a talk about the episode and, there's a lot that we, I think, are in, in the same page with uh, regarding our response to domestic violence and the Christian response to domestic violence. So I'm really looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward for other listeners to really get engaged with this, whether you're a pastor, street preacher, uh, sidewalk counselor, homeschool mom, just a brother in Christ, whatever it is that you are, I think you're going to benefit from this episode. Yeah. Yeah, praise the Lord, man. Praise the Lord. And then uh, the 31st, we don't have anything at the moment. It is up in the air uh, debating whether or not to play something old from the old Berean Boys radio or uh, oh, something man. else. Or, uh, you How know, many of those going... episodes you got? Uh, man, there was only like, I think, eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so I don't have a I don't have a vast uh, amount to dig from, you know, but uh but I I did thought I I've had a few ideas. I thought about maybe taking some clips from the ones that are remaining and just pulling a little bit here and a little bit there and putting it together uh, or just playing one in its entirety like we did with this uh, last one we did when uh was the beginning of of the relationship we have as friends and brothers in Christ uh, coming together uh, when we interviewed you for the book Apostasy your book Apostasy which people can get at g220ministries.com you can go and download that uh, uh there plug. Uh, again, plug. g220ministries.com 
Opacity. Go check it out. But uh, yeah, you know so what I'm I guess thinking too. One episode you that? should play. What's you should that? play the false dichotomies one we did. I was thinking about the other day. Yeah, we could do that. We could go back and just play another uh, one an episode that we've already played, you know, and put it up there for people to listen to. Yeah, we could definitely do that. Uh, on the 7th of, Feb- of February, uh, we're going to be talking about Baptist Covenant Theology uh, with Pastor Josh Tinkham. And so that's going to be uh, an interesting show. Uh, hope, to, hope to learn a lot from there, even though I am Baptist and I'm Covenant. Uh, you know, you, know, but, you uh, know what's funny, though? There are some Presbyterians out there, and this is no offense, but there are some Presbyterians who believe that there's no such thing as a Baptist Reformed. I'm just saying. No, I, yeah, I, I, I know. I know. I saw a, I saw a picture. Um, Colin Pearson <clears throat> on Facebook. He posted this this uh, like evolutionary thing that I saw. I didn't comment on it. I was going to, um, but it, it had this evolution from Roman Catholics being this monkey, and then you know like the caveman type thing up to a man, and then it was like Lutherans and Anglicans, and then uh, Dutch Reformed, and then it comes to Presbyterian. You know, and they're walking you know, educated with a beard and a beer in their hand and, and, and whatnot. Um, and I want to say, and I was going to text or, uh, put a message here and say, you're almost there. <laughs> you're almost <laughs> to truly being right, uh, at the Baptist, uh, you know, view, but that's one of the reasons Josh, he, uh, he reached out and said, Hey, you know, a lot of times people, they, there is some distinction between Baptist covenant theology and Presbyterian, obviously. And so there's mm-hmm. some things that we, we definitely hold differently and it might be a good, show to, you know, kind of talk about some of those things from the Baptist covenant perspective. Um, so that should be a good show. Uh, some conferences, I was trying to pull these up as I was, um, going through these. And so there's some conferences that are coming up. There's, there's some big conferences that are out there. You've got the G3 that everybody's excited about. Um, and then there's other, I'm sure there's many other conferences people had mentioned. I put up a a thing on Facebook. Like, look, people are looking forward to the shepherds conference this year. And, um, there's going to be much to do with the reformation this year. Because, mm. you know, it's the 500th uh, anniversary of the Reformation. So uh, yep. there's there's quite a bit going on there. But here's some other – some conferences. You know, uh, it's called Borderland, or Borderland Open Air Conference and Training uh, with Robert Gray, Mike Stockwell, Scott Smith, and Ryan Denton. And the dates for this is January 27th. So it's this month. Uh, January 27th in El Paso from 6 to 8, January 28th in El Paso, um, and then January 29th in Albuquerque, and January 30th 30th in Albuquerque. So that's a great opportunity. You know, you could get out there uh, if you're interested in doing some open-air preaching and getting some training in that. Um, These are some good brothers. Uh, I know Robert Gray, Mike Stockwell, uh, Scott Smith, I've seen him on uh, online. I don't know him personally, but, uh, and then Ryan Denton, not sure, uh, know him personally, but, uh, I'm sure this is a great opportunity to get out there and do some open air and learn how to do it from these guys. Um, some other conferences here, let me switch over. Uh, there is an evangelism reformation in Hearst, Texas, June 16th through the 17th in 2017. You got speakers like Bodhi Bauckham, Jeff Rose, Jason Lyle, Scott Brown, Jeff Pollard, Chuck O'Neill, Mark Spence, and Ben Seewald. And then let me see here. Yeah, that's some conferences. I know Remember Ministries has a conference coming up and uh, John Eckel, who's a part of uh, Remember Ministries and host alongside uh, Anthony Sylvester on Creation Revival Radio, uh, will be on tomorrow night. I believe they have a show tomorrow night uh, talking about their new book that's coming out. And hopefully, maybe I'll shoot them a, a message to say, hey, put some information out about that conference that you got coming up. Uh, but they're also doing something on the Reformation this year. And I can't remember the date if it's April. Or if it's yeah, I think it was a free time. Yeah, I can't remember. I remember John yeah. said something to me about it in the past. I just can't remember the dates. Yeah, I, I'm thinking it's April, but I'm not sure because I know that there's also an Ohio Fire conference that Andrew Rappaport puts on. I think it's in April as well. So I don't know um, how close those are. I, I actually, I think they were pretty close. I think it was last year we went to Ohio Fire, and the very next weekend was the In the Beginning God conference. So um, I'm sure they're pretty close and around the same time. But those are a few there. Uh, something I wanted to put out um, with Austin was going to be on the show, but uh, something we're trying to do at Christ the Rock Church, if you're in the area, um, especially if, if you're in the Lorraine County area and you're listening, um, great. I'm glad you're listening if you're in the Lorraine County area. <laughs> but uh, if you are, um, theology session, we're going to be doing this uh, 
it's going to be like a, a, an all-nighter type thing. David Platt kind of did these before with the Secret Church, and it's something we kind of want to do with calling them theology sessions, but we want to do these um, quarterly um, – like long periods of time where we're going to sit from 6 to 10 p.m., which is like four hours, and go through parts of the Bible. You know, and we're going to be dealing with uh, Genesis um, for this first one. It's going to be February 17th from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. So like I said, it's four hours of being there, um, just taking in the Word of God. Uh, there's going to be four sessions, God's pr uh, presupposed, uh, the fall the flood and Abraham to Christ. So uh, it's going to be, it's going to be something uh, we're really hoping to uh, use as a, uh, a teaching tool to the Lorraine County area, to other churches and uh, people who really want to dig into the word of God. Um, and so uh, just pray for us with that, but that's also something that's coming up. All right, man, we are like almost 30 minutes into the show. We haven't even got to no. the, all the, gone. What the, time the go? article already. Yeah. Um, so I guess we can go ahead and get into that. Let me close out some of these other screens here. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about you the Jesus 20 radio network. You can't tell people you have network, screens man. open. It's so uncut and raw. You can't do that. What's that? You can't tell people you have screens open. It's too uncut and raw. You're supposed to be like all primed and proper and have this stuff memorized. No, I, yeah, I don't memorize anything. If I try to memorize stuff, man, it's it's, <laughs> it's bad. And I will get all the things mixed up. I'll tell people to go to one other person's conference and say these people are speaking over there, and that would just be bad. Um, <clears throat> but we was going to talk a little bit about the G220 Radio Network. We'll take a few minutes here. You want to say anything about the network and any of the shows? Or um, I know there's one good show that uh, <laughs> Pastor Austin really likes, and that's called Tongue Waggers. Yeah, apparently recently he just told me he blessed me with his uh, his um, encouragement. So I appreciate that, Pastor Austin. It was nice to hear from your your feedback. But yeah. Tongue Waggers is definitely one of the, the shows that we like putting on. Mike and I love talking about the show and putting together some of the things. So if you are out there and you're listening to the show, by all means, you know, give us some feedback. Let us know what we can do to try to <clears throat> make it a little bit better. And uh, we welcome that. We really do. Um, some of the things that I wanted to be able to say, G20 Radio has been a really huge blessing for myself, hopefully for the listeners as well, for all the different things that we're trying to put on, all the different topics that we try to put on. And like I was telling you, Ricky, and you you said this before, and you started to, you started to blast it, is that the capability to be able to capture natural conversation with regular people about supernatural topics, I think, is one of the things that's really helped me see G220 Radio uh, somewhat set apart. You know, we have conversational debate. We have people on the show talking about different subjects, and they're going back and forth. And this is what really mirrors uh, the means of grace for fellowship that we normally would have, whether it be on the street, in our churches, maybe in the couch, at home, and we're just talking about the things of the Lord, and Lord willing, you know, all of us have this one goal, it's singularity of truth, and we want to be able to know God, we want to be able to enjoy Him, and we want to know Him intimately, so Lord willing, it doesn't come off as just, you know, people just getting on a show and just wanting to debate their point and wanting to prove their point, but Lord willing, it's, it's having the, uh, the single thought of wanting to know the scriptures more, become more intimate with God, and uh, live a godly life. Yeah. And we've got, uh, that's definitely one of the things we enjoy doing. Don't claim to know everything here, uh, but we definitely love to talk about the things of the Lord, and, and we love to bring people on and, and, and talk about it and iron sharpen iron, or bring some people on even with different opposing views, um, you know, in hopes that they come to truth but also for the listener's benefit to see that, hey, we're regular people having regular conversations. We don't always answer things properly out on the streets when we're talking to people. And sometimes that comes across even in the show. Um, but, I mean, we are trying to um, show that, you know, this is this is just kind of a real thing. This is what real conversations sound like, you know. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, it, you know, hopefully the, the uh, listeners uh, can benefit from that. And say that, hey, you know what, if, if if people like Ricky can get on here and do this, and I am by far not the most educated, I don't know all of the scriptures, and, and it's still always a learning process. And so if I can do it, if I can share the gospel with people and get out there and get out of that comfort zone, uh, we want to encourage you guys to do it too. You know, it's all by the by the grace of God um, that we do, mm -hmm. do these things and we are able to do these things. So, uh, yeah, and we've got the other shows, you know, we've got uh, Creation Revival, and then uh, that's once a month show. Then we've got Christ the Rock Church, who every Sunday, um, those are usually up. Um, 
we get the sermons up for that. And then coming soon will be the standard of truth with April Chapman. She's been a guest on the show before uh, and she's going to be hosting her own show here on the network. And, uh, you know, think it's going to be a good thing and, and we'll see how that goes, you know? Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. April, if you're listening, man, nice to have you guys, nice to have you on the network. It's going to be really uh, neat to have a, a female's perspective on specific theological issues. So definitely going to be tuning into that one. Yeah. All right, man, let's try to get into this, uh, this uh, article and talking about how to reach millennials. If we haven't lost everybody already, because millennials, you know, and whoever was listening might have been like, man, these guys are just talking and talking and talking, uh, which we don't do that mo most of the time. But that's, you know, um, again, it's real conversation. And, uh, you know, hey, it's just the way it goes uh, for tonight. But <laughs> um, this article, it starts off, it's called um, 12 Reasons Millennials Are Over Church. And so it seems to be written by a group called To Save a Life, and I don't – maybe I'll see the author's name at the bottom. But anyways, he gets yeah, into some Eaton. statistics. What is it? Sam Eaton, uh, founder of Recklessly okay. Alive, a suicide prevention ministry apparently. Okay. Yeah, To Save a Life. Um, I remember watching that movie once before. I don't know if it's connected, but uh, – it goes with that song, too, as well. Okay, so it says, according to this study uh, and many others like it, church attendance is, and impressions of the church are the lowest in recent history and most drastic among millennials described as 22 to 35-year-olds. So I don't fall into that. I'm not a millennial. You know, I'm, I'm too old, according to this statistic. <laughs> but that's okay. That's all right. But it says only oh, two man. in 10 Americans. I know. Only, I feel like it too. It says only two in 10 Americans under 30 believe attending a church is important or worthwhile. And all, it's an all-time low. 59% of millennials raised in church have dropped out. 35% of millennials have an anti-church stance, believing the church does more harm than good. And millennials are least likely are the least likely age group of anyone to attend church by far. That's just some of the statistics that they've given, you know, and I've, I've looked at some other statistics from other things like Barna and things. And sometimes some of these statistics can be all over the place. And one has statistics mm -hmm. this way and another one has statistics another way. And so, you know, sometimes you really never can tell uh, truly by the statistics, you know, but uh, it's got 12 points here, 12 reasons, and so we're going to kind of go through and read some of these and then just talk about them, touch on them a little bit. We've got about 30 minutes, so we'll see what we can get through here uh, in that time. But the first one says, nobody's listening to us. Millennials value voice and receptivity above all else. When a church forgoes ahead without ever asking for our input, we get the message loud and clear. Nobody cares what we think. Why then should we blindly serve an institution that we cannot change or shape? And the solution that they're giving is create regular outlets, forums, surveys, meetings to discover the needs of young adults, both inside and outside the church. Invite millennials to serve on leadership teams or advisory boards where they can make a difference. Hire a young, youth, ad young adults pastor uh, who has the desire and skill set to connect with millennials. So nobody's listening yeah. to us. Well, I mean, join the club. I'm the, the, sometimes people aren't just going to listen to you. Um, I've been ignored plenty of times, whether in church or not. But, I mean, the point of the congregation and you coming to the local assembly is so that you might serve others. So if you come in, you feel like nobody's listening to you, well, sometimes it's going to happen. But for the most part, the goal is that you serve others and be a selfless servant. Now, if all of us did that at the same time, and sooner or later we're all going to hear each other at some point, um, so I get it. I get the fact that some people aren't listening. But, you know, your goal is not so much to be heard. Your goal is to hear the Word of God and to serve others. That's just my perspective. I don't know what you think. You know, I, I agree. Um, it, it, it seems to be, and I think more as we get in through this this article, uh, that it's more of self selfishness, you know, that kind of comes out. It's It's more self-serving. Uh, what I think and what I feel it should be like. Uh, and, and I think um, that doesn't necessarily have to be with millennials. That's, that's a lot of people's attitude going into the church, 
is what can I get out of this? And hey, you know, I have input. You guys should listen to my input. You should do things the way I want. I remember when I was in a, I was, I grew up in a fundamentalist Baptist church. And I remember when I first got saved and I went back there, there was a, a group of guys who did not like the way the pastor was doing something. And we're sitting in a business meeting and they got up and they took over the business meeting and put their keys down and said, we're done. We're tired of this. And I was sitting there like, what is going on? Because they were not being listened to. They wanted to do something a certain way. And it was all about grounds work. It was about where the leaves were going to be placed. And I'm this new believer sitting here like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, they're oh, complaining man. about this because they wanted to put stuff in this one place and nobody's listening to where they wanted to put it. And, and so it's not just, these were older guys. So it's not just millennials. I think there's a lot of people that have that problem. Uh, they're going into church for the wrong reasons and thinking that, Hey, w here's what I can or what, what, what can benefit me so you should listen to me so that it will benefit me rather than how can I serve, like you were saying, the others around the church? Because that's why we're given the gifts. That's why we're a part of the body so that we can serve others, as you said there, George. Yeah, definitely. Uh, number two, we're sick of hearing about values and mission statements. Um, this, I'm not going to completely talk about everything here, but it basically it comes down to is that uh, everybody's moving in the same direction or should be moving in the same direction anyways. Isn't the Lord our God, loving the Lord our God, and loving our neighbor as itself the, the universal church's task? So why does every church need to have its own mission statement? Um, he's basically trying to say what would happen if the entire church in America just came together with our commonalities and with a just concise mission statement. So his solution was to stop wasting time on religious mumbo-jumbo and get back to the heart of the gospel, explain your missions uh, and your values to the church. And it, uh, you don't have to explain your mission values to the church, or it's overtly, overly religious and too complicated statements. So basically it seems to be getting to the point where the mission statements, everybody seems to be having one and everybody's sick of hearing it. I don't know, what do you think about that? This is kind of an interesting topic. Yeah, it is. And, and I mean, I posted something um, at the beginning of the year that there was going to be a lot of churches, a lot of these big, um, you know, what do you call these seeker sensitive type churches that are going to come out in the beginning of the year with their vision of where they want to go in 2017 and their mission statement, you know, and, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of that stuff is a lot of nonsense. It, it's It's what they want to accomplish, how big they want to get you know, building plans to build a gym or to, you know, I know churches that have like um, actual recreational weightlifting facilities and, and, you know, basketball courts. And so in that sense, that stuff, you know, I don't see a, I don't see a, a, a real um, desire or need in um, that being your mission or the vision of the church, you know, yeah. to build these things on for the people. Now, to sit back and tell people that, hey, look, especially the new year, maybe you have new people within your church, or maybe it doesn't have to be the new year. Maybe it's just whatever time of year you, you've got new people, you're, you're, you're growing, and you want to make sure they understand the purposes of this church. And, and it's, you know, to glorify God, to go out and share the gospel with people. And you want to make that known and constantly make that known to the people to encourage them to go and make disciples, to glorify God in the gifts that he's given, as we talked about with the first one, to serve other people in the church. I don't, I don't see a problem with that, you know? Yeah. Those kinds of vision statements are quick, they're concise, just to the point. Obviously, they're needed, they're necessary. And, you know, even some vision statements that might be in biblical are necessary, too, but for the most part, it just seems like they're saying that we're sick of hearing hearing about visions and value statements. But the problem is with the millennial generation, even my generation, before even the millennial generation was coming up, um, truth is so relative. It's just not about what you believe. It's not about what your values and visions are. It's about what the Bible says. So uh, if you're sick of hearing it, then I understand. Okay, fine. But that once again, you're losing focus as to what the mission of the church is in the first place. Yeah. Number three, helping the poor isn't a priority. And again, it goes on and says some things like, let's, the cl let's clock the number of hours the average church attender spends in church-type activities like Bible studies, meetings, groups, social functions, book clubs, planning meetings, talking about building community, discussing a new mission statement. Now, some of these things are absolutely – I mean, I want to talk about you know, helping the poor. I, I think that that is a very important thing to help the poor, to go out mm -hmm. and, and to take care of those that are in need around you. Um, first and foremost, with, within your own church, within your own body of believers, if you have people hurting, um, you should be taking care of them. 
you know, within your, your body. But then outside of that, if you see people that are hurting and you can help, you know, and your church is able to, to help them, then, then that's a wonderful thing. Um, but to take that and say, you know, these Bible studies, the meetings, groups, and things like that, um, some of these things like book clubs, functions, those can just be, uh, you know, and um, I'm trying to think of the right word. Uh, those could be things that people enjoy to do. So it could be some enjoyment that they have with getting together with other believers. But like planning meetings, you kind of need that in the church because <laughs> you need to be able to plan, you know, what, what, what your, yeah. you know, not vision. But if you're, if you're sitting down and saying, hey, look, well, these are some things we need to do with the, with the body of Christ that we have here, the local church. These are, this is the way we need to, to go. These are some sermons that we're going to set up or a series we're going to start preaching from this book. Planning meetings are important. Um, Bible studies are very important because you're sitting down and studying the word of God, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, I mean, I don't know. What do you think, brother? No, I mean, yeah, you definitely want to be able to do these things. And um, there's all kinds of priorities that the church has. Obviously, reaching the lost is definitely one of them. Um, it seems like this guy is more of a, a rebuke for people who, I guess, aren't doing these things. I'm not quite sure. This, this, it seems to have this air of if you're not doing anything to the poor, then you're not doing anything at all as a church, which I guess is, is to some degree is a stab. But at the same time, I mean, come on. I mean, there's there is a, a radical amount of things that the church must be involved in, and I, I don't see how this part right here is really helpful, I guess, as to why a millennial is skipping out of church. You know, one, one more thing, too, with that is one of the things in our church is like this, and, and I've heard some other churches, you know, state this, that, look, we can't as a church have a program for every single thing that somebody is passionate about. But if somebody mm-hmm. comes up and says, hey, I'm really passionate about going down to feed the homeless, we'd say, praise the Lord, put it together, <laughs> get something going. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's so, what we in the military. Well, we're glad that you want to see a problem fixed. Yeah, Here you go. Yeah, you just you just volunteered. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so th- th- that that would, you know, eliminate a lot of this, this complaining about that. You know, if you want to see the poor helped, go down to a local shelter. Go help them out. Go give them some clothes. Go, go give them, take some food down there. You know, take the gospel. Don't just give them food and don't just give them clothes. Take the gospel. But, I mean, um, you know, you can do that and get other people mm-hmm. within the church then maybe seeing what you're doing. And you might be able to put it out there and get others to come along with you. And then it might grow. And you might get other churches that are seeing what you're doing that of like-minded faith, not, you know, uh, apostate or heretical churches, but I mean, uh, biblical churches come together and say, Hey, yeah, we see what you're doing. We want to jump in and we want to help, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Number four, we're tired of you blaming the culture. I guess millennials are tired of us blaming the culture for all the world's ills. Um, we're aware of the downfalls of the culture. Believe it or not, we're actually living it too. perhaps focus on how terrible, perhaps it's easier to focus on how terrible the world is out there than actually address the mess within. Now, to some degree, I could guess I can sort of sympathize with this. I mean, people are blaming the world, but yet we're not going out there. We're actually preaching the gospel. So there is some blame there. But at the same time, of course, I, I don't know to what degree, this is too subjective, what degree uh, their complaints are. I mean, sure, this might be the cry of some millennials, but once again, we're going back to who's deciding who as to what we're trying to preach here. Is it these people who are coming in? Are they supposed to be you know, all to dictate what the Word of God says? Because, I mean, the Word of God is directly against many things in the culture outside and inside the church walls. So, I mean, there is a lot of things that the Word of God teaches, and if this person is supposing that we're supposed to not talk about how terrible the world is, then I don't really know how much information they're going to get from the Word of God that teaches us how we're supposed to walk godly in this wicked age. Yeah, and and the whole blaming the culture, I think if you right, rightly understand the Word of God, it's not the culture that we blame. It's the fact that we have the sin heart. nature. Yeah, it's Amen. the yeah. heart. So we have a sin nature, so we have to address that problem. The culture is just the effect of that. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you address the heart of the problem, and and then that may begin to shape and change the culture around you from your yep. community that's within your family and then neighbors and, and so forth. Um, number five, the you can't sit with us effect. Um, and this one says, there is a life-changing movie, all humans, talking about the mean girls thing. Uh, it says in this film, like, this girl does it, wears a different color, and then she comes in, and, well, you can't sit with us. So I guess what, what they're trying to say here is, you know, um, not to have, like, cliques, not to have this, uh, you know, mm-hmm. 
group thing where well, well this is our group and so you you don't you really belong here you're you're one of the singles we're married so you need to go over there with the singles or you need to you know go in there with the teen groups or whatever and i think that's what they're trying to get at here with this um unfortunately i mean i'm not going to say that's the, the, the case in every church because there's a lot of great churches out there sometimes that does happen because mm-hmm. by nature we're all sinful people and you're coming together there are some things you just may uh kind of uh, gravitate to, you know, if people are like-minded, if, if, if you've got somebody in the church that likes to work on, and I'm just throwing it out there, say you've got a couple guys that like to work on vehicles, you know, um, they may come together and talk about that, you know, or mm-hmm. I'm just you throwing out that as, as an example, but I mean, or you're like-minded in certain other areas. Maybe you like to go out on the streets as we do and share the gospel. And you have a couple people in the church that do that. You're going to kind of gravitate towards those people, you know, mm-hmm. not because you want to let push out the others, you know, and make them feel like they're not part of the group. But sometimes that that just naturally happens. Um, doesn't mean that the other people that our people aren't trying to push the others away. But unfortunately, sometimes that does happen. You know, in some mm-hmm. churches. Yeah, it does. Number six: distrust and misallocation of resources. Uh, over and over, we've been told to tithe and give ten percent of our incomes to the church. But where does the money actually go? And then he talks about how don't trust institutions. We've witnessed over, over and over. We witnessed over and over again how corrupt and self-serving they can be, and they basically are just calling for a little bit more transparency in their money. Now I can agree with this. Obviously, our church. Uh, I would say obviously it's not obviously everybody, but it's our church. It is. We do have uh, transparency. We have accountability, um, and it's good to have a church that does have some accountability concerning the budget and what things they're going to spend their money on. So if you don't have that kind of church, you know obviously ask why if you can, but. Um, I think this is a pretty decent point, but once again, is this a, a relevant claim as to why we're not coming to church? I mean, once again, a lot of these things are hard issues that I don't think people understand when it comes to the nature of man, why we need to be born again. Um, there's just a lot of different things as to what people are going through, especially when it comes to the issue of sanctification. So, I don't know, this is this seems to be more, it's starting to sound more like an atheistic article than it sounds like a, a person who's supposed to be a Christian. But I can understand some of his points, and this one being a valid one. You know, money is a big issue, and we need to be transparent. Yeah. Number seven, we want to be mentored, not preached at. Uh, preaching just doesn't reach our generation like our parents and grandparents. Uh, the millennial church attendance uh, is down. It's very low. Uh, so it says we have millions of podcasts and YouTube videos of pastors uh, the world over at your fingertips. For that reason, the currency of good preaching is at its lowest value in history. Well, we talked about this a little bit, you know, even before. I, I think that when they say we want to be mentored, I think discipleship needs to happen. And and, and unfortunately, in many churches, it doesn't happen um, to the best that we could probably do. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, like, I think we could do much better basically when it comes to discipleship, you know, take un- older men, taking younger men under their wing to kind of um, help them if they're married, how, how to, how to live a, a married life, how to, to deal with things with your spouse and with your children, just taking them under mm-hmm. the wing and showing them things and showing them how to live this Christian life out. I think that's a, that's a, a, a thing that we, we could always do better in and we can always see more of. You know, the thing about not being preached at, I think the preaching of the gospel needs to happen for unbelievers and believers. So, mm-hmm. you know, when you're preaching the word and you're expositing scripture or you're going through through the word of God, that is for you to be sanctified, for you to be changed by the preaching of the word. So depending upon what you're talking about when, when it says preached at, what the, the, the person may mean when they're talking about being preached at, as far as, you know, having good um, – all these podcasts and YouTube videos. Yeah. There you can find great preachers out there. You can find some really bad ones too. And I think unfortunately what a lot of people end up watching is the bad ones. And then they say, there's nothing good out there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, they experience bad ones too. And that's unfortunate, but you can't, you can't yeah. take every single experience and just judge everything by that experience. You have to take everything with its individual circumstance. Number eight, we want to feel valued. Um, I don't really know how to say anything about this, but, you know, one of the statements on this particular point that really disturbed me was millennials are told by this world from the second we wake up to the second we are taking a sleeping pill that we aren't good enough. We desperately need the church to tell us we are enough, exactly the way we are. No conditions or expectations. We need a church that sees us and believes in us, that cheers us on and encourages us to chase our big, crazy dreams. 
Return, return to point number one, in, which means listening, and go out of your way to thank people who are giving so much of their life to the church. Now, I don't mind giving uh, thankfulness to the people who are in the church, but man, when it comes to this specific point, uh, feeling valued, I get it, okay? Sometimes it's the, 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 there's depression, there's a lot of other things that go on, especially amongst pastors and teachers. We, we tend to be a little bit more uh, depressed because of the things that we experience, and um, unfortunately we have to learn how to be able to rely on the Lord. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are on, uh, in the church who, are, who might be emotionally suffering, and we don't do a very good job of uh, being encouraging as well as good uh, exhorters of the Word of God and of one another. But when it comes to this point, uh, what we desperately need, no conditions or expectations, and believe in us, and all, I mean, this is just pragmatic, humanistic mumbo-jumbo. I mean, this point could be just done away with altogether. Uh, there's no valid point whatsoever as to why I have to tell you that you're good enough. Um, it has nothing to do with being good. It has nothing to do with your ability. It has everything to do with his sufficiency and his worth. And we find value in that. And our value is in the fact that we are made in the image of God, of course. But it, once again, it goes back to God. It doesn't come to us. Anything in us, really, it should we should abandon. Um, and I don't understand why this point is even being made whatsoever when it comes to why millennials aren't coming to church because maybe they're so full of themselves uh, pride and a lot of other things but uh there's 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 a lot there that i think is just completely unbiblical i think what comes to mind for me is when i think of the paul washer sermon where he says you know your parents and whatever are concerned about your self-esteem but i can care less about your self-esteem you yeah. know um and that's what comes to mind when i'm hearing that uh number nine we want to we want you to talk about we want you to talk to us about com controversial issues uh, because no one is. Uh, people in their 20s and 30s are making the biggest decisions of their entire lives, career, education, relationships, marriage, sex, finances, children, purpose, chemicals, chemicals, I don't even know what that means, chemicals, body image. Uh, we need someone consistently speaking truth into every single one of those areas. I think the Word of God does speak truth into all those areas. If you are in a church that's expounding scriptures and going through the Word and faithfully proclaiming it, it's going to deal with all those topics eventually. And if you're not there because you don't want to come to church because of all these other things that we're going through, you're not going to get those. You're not going to get the controversial mm -hmm. issues. You may come one week and he's talking about something and you're thinking, well, that doesn't even apply to me. You know, um, one, you're probably not listening because the word of God is sharper than a two edged sword piercing. And, and so it's going to be uh, if you're if you're truly there to worship the Lord and to hear what the word of God is, is speaking to you that day, you know, through his word, um, not in some charismatic type way. But speaking to you and, and to, to change you and to grow you and mold you to more into the image of Christ, um, you're going to come across those, those controversial issues, issues, you know, the more you're sitting under sound preaching. Mm -hmm. Public perception, number 10. Time to focus on changing the public perception of the church within the community. The neighbors, the people around our church buildings that like to audibly thank the congregation for the neighborhood. We should be serving the C-R-A-P out of them. Now, I said that lightweight because I'm not sure how people feel about that word. But anyway, the individual, when the public opinion shows one-third of millennials are anti-church, we are outright failing at being the aroma of Christ. Once again, too vague. I don't know what he's trying to get at here. He's basically trying to call us to serve the local government and the schools, find ways to connect with neighbors and make your presence known in the, in, in the city. Now, that I can understand. Uh, but the problem is our perception oftentimes is still very humanistic, very pragmatic. It's not gospel-centered. It's not Christ-centered. So, yes, I do agree. We should have a good public perception. However, that public perception is not gauged by the public's perception. The public's perception should not be the thing that we look to to gauge whether or not we're being effective in the community. W the only perception we should care about is God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the things that, you know, the public's perception of you, if you're preaching the gospel faithfully, they're not going to be happy with you. You know, you can do things to, you know, um, help the community. And I think you should be seen. I think that if the church is out there and preaching the gospel faithfully, you know, preaching on the streets or, you know, getting involved in the community and loving the people, you know, people are appreciative of that. But when you, st even, even that, when you start preaching the gospel to them, their perception of you is like, yeah, that's great. Thanks for the stuff you're giving me or helping me with, but I don't want that. Mm -hmm. I don't want that gospel, you know, because nobody – we talk about persecution, and when, when – you know, many times when we see things in the, in the – you know, other countries and stuff, and here in America, we, we think that we don't face persecution, but the public – 
the people that are not Christians do not like the gospel. And so if you're Mm -hmm. preaching it faithfully, they're going to have a perception of you that's not going to be uh, a good one. Uh, Number 11, stop talking about us unless you're actually going to do something. Uh, Words without follow-up are far worse than ignoring us completely. Despite the stereotypes about us, we are listening to phrases being spoken in our general direction. Uh, Lip service, however, uh, it doesn't cut it. Uh, We are scrutinizing every action that follows what you say because we're sick of being ignored and listening to broken promises. So their solution is stop speaking in abstract sound bites and make a tangible plan for how to reach millennials. Uh, If you want to, if you want the respect of our generation under promise or over deliver. This is an interesting one. I mean, It, there's a lot there. Obviously, there's some concerns there. And, you know, the, the show is supposed to be how to reach millennials. You know, what, one of the ways before we even go into verse or last tw- point 12 is if you really want to reach millennials, preach the gospel. I mean, the gospel itself is the power of God unto salvation for any generation, for anybody here who believes, for the Jew first and the Gentile. And you got to think about the fact that these people, most of the people within the millennial generation, have not exposed, have not been exposed to absolute truth. They're being told that truth is relative, that there is no absolute truth, that truth is post-modern. Basically, there is no real way to find out what truth is. You can't offend anybody. So the, the, most, the, the most loving thing you can do to reach a millennial is not just the good works that you profess, that you say you know Christ and you, how you follow the good works, but tell them about Christ. Tell them about the law. Tell them about the conviction of sin. Tell them about heaven and hell and those kinds of things that are absolute. Because if you don't, they're going to continue to make these demands of of the church. And unfortunately, the church is at fault because they're not preaching the gospel. So it's like a a never-ending cycle. It just continues to spin out of control. But God's church, the real church, the true church, his bride is always going to be on earth and his will always prevail regardless of what generation they fall under. So if you're a Christian, uh, be encouraged. Uh, the gates of hell will not overcome God's people. And number 12, you're failing to adapt. This is the last point that says, here's the bottom line, church. You aren't reaching millennials. Enough of the excuses and the blame. We need to accept reality and intentionally move forward this generation that is terrifyingly anti-church. And then, of course, they say, look at the data and admit you're out of your element to talk to this generation and a lot of other things that are very, very uh, snarky. So looking at this point, it seems that you're failing to adapt. The question is, in what way are we supposed to adapt then? Are we supposed to adapt by taking the Word of God and shaping it to the culture, or do we take the culture and shape it to the Word of God? And I don't know exactly what he means by this point, but just based off of the last 10 or 11, I can almost guess that he's not exactly thinking about things from a strictly sufficiency of Scripture kind of mindset. Yeah. Well, some of the examples he gives there, he quotes Bill Clinton, says the price of doing the same old thing is far higher than the price of change. You know, H.G. Wells, oh, yeah, Adapter Bill Clinton, Parish, I love him. You know, and so, I mean, this is, this is, again, the thing. It goes back to 11 when you talked about preach the gospel. You preach the gospel and God converts the soul. God changes the heart of the individual. If God changes the heart of the individual, you don't need to adapt to the culture. You don't need to adapt to pragmatism and ways. You don't need to adapt to having uh, youth groups or um, uh, um, what do you, college career groups to reach that age of individuals. You don't need to have the rock band and the lights flashing and all the other things in these seeker-sensitive mega churches to reach them. You don't need to adapt to do that because if you are if you're a small church, you know, with maybe 10, 15 people, you know, maybe a church plant, maybe you're, you know, um, just a faithful preaching, proclaiming the word of God, and you have millennials, older people, whatever. They they're not if they're coming because they're truly regenerated. They're not coming because you're adapting to their needs. You're preaching the gospel faithfully, and God has drawn them, draw draw them to Himself, and then drawing them into the church, because the Bible says, you know, that the Lord places people as he sees fit, placing them into the body so that they can hear the word of God and grow from that, you know? Mm -hmm. So you don't need to adapt. You don't need to come up with all these pragmatic ways. You just preach the gospel, as we said in in the point 11, you you was mentioned in there, and you preach it faithfully. You preach the gospel to believers, unbelievers, and then you faithfully expound the word of God. Amen. Well, that's that article, Um, 12 Reasons Millennials Are Over the Church. I think I'm going to send a a message out to this guy. 
uh, let him know we did a show on it and would love to hear his feedback, you know, from any of the points that we said, you know, or we, we kind of went through uh, and hear what he would have to, you know, respond to that. And maybe we can get a dialogue with this, this man. Um, brother, we uh, made it to the end uh, just in time. So uh, any last words? Love you. <laughs> Love you too, bro. Uh, that's been G220 Radio. Until next time then, God bless and good night. If you have any questions about G220 Radio or would like to leave a comment, you can contact us at g220radio at gmail.com. We would love to hear your feedback. Also, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. Maybe one of the reasons so many people in the church aren't making disciples of all nations is because they're not really disciples in the first place. You think about Jesus and his disciples from the very beginning to the very end. Making disciples is in the DNA of this thing, right? To be a disciple involves making disciples. Follow me, Matthew 4, and I will, what? I'll make you fishers of men. Never make a gospel appeal to people's emotions. Never. Never. That's why we don't have some kind of an emotional appeal here and play all kinds of small team music in the background. And it amazes me that we believe this, that God would crush and kill his own son, but let you slide. Not for a minute. At this moment, God commands all men to repent and believe that today is the day of salvation, that you are to flee from the wrath to come, to flee from the law of Moses that condemns you into the city of refuge who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Run to Him. Insurance-minded speeches from GEICO. It's a common expression, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. However, what if the horse's mouth is filled with useful insurance tools? This is the exact case with the GEICO app. Yes, the app is free and therefore a gift horse. However, look inside the app and behold, emergency roadside assistance, digital ID cards, bill pay. Get the GEICO app, look it in the mouth, get amazing services. Thank you.